Now, so far, the guys we've been dealing with, who well, philosophers we've been dealing with, have been concerned with trying to explain reality, and they do it mostly in terms of stuff, right? What's it made of? What's the uh, you know component uh, or you know the fundamental uh, stuff of all of reality? You know what Thales says? It's water. Uh, Anaximander provides his uh, arguments to say that it's boundless, and Anaximenes uh, says that uh, well, you know boundless isn't going to work; it doesn't explain anything. Uh, so it's air, right? It's still you know still sufficiently you know amorphous, but it's nonetheless air. You know, Pythagoras is interested in the same project. He is still trying to answer what it you know what is fundament what things fundamentally are, right? What's going to be the constituent thing, right? What's going to explain all of reality? But he has a very different idea than saying it's stuff. So you might wonder exactly what Pythagoras has in mind here. Well, let's put ourselves in Pythagoras's place. Now, he was a huge fan of numbers and mathematics. If you've ever heard of the Pythagorean theorem, that's who it comes from. <laughs> Uh, he was a really big fan of numbers because he saw, saw a strong connection between numbers and the world around him. Right? So, for instance, consider these pebbles. Right? Now, with the pebbles, this is probably one of the ways he really kind of started counting. When we have one pedal, a pebble, we just have you know, the one thing, the one dimension. When you have two pebbles, you have a line. When you have three pebbles, you have a plane. Okay? And when you add a fourth pebble, you have a figure. You have a solid. So right away, Pythagoras started drawing a connection between number and the objects around him. And, you know, in his defense, numbers are everywhere. They really are, okay? Um, let's just think about this for a second. Uh, everything has a weight, right? That's one number. Everything has a density. That's another number, okay? Uh, I am uh, six feet tall. There's a number, okay? I have four limbs. That's another number. Uh, my body temperature, well, it's really sunny outside right now, and I'm outside, so it might be a little bit higher than 98.6, but, you know, theoretically, my body temperature is around 98.6. All right, there's all kinds of ways to use numbers to qu quantify what's happening with me and the world around me, right? We can start looking at these trees, number of branches, how tall are they? And not even just some kind of incidental things like that. Number plays a great part in what kind of thing it is. Okay, so, um, so just for instance, uh, numbers uh, are found in ma oh, sorry, in math numbers are found in music all the time. In fact, music used to be considered applied mathematics, specifically where numbers and beauty intersected. All right? If you don't believe me, well, well think about this. Um, a scale, a musical scale, is defined in terms of the, the steps, the number of steps from one note to another. A chord, same thing. A chord is defined in terms of the number that it, cor that it corresponds to on the scale. Uh, harmony, same thing. Right? Harmony is going to be determined by number, or at least can be described by number. A color wheel. Right? My shirt is red, the trees are green, the sky is blue. Uh, these, all these colors cor have a corresponding number in terms of wavelengths. Okay? Uh, chemistry, even chemistry, all the uh, elements on the periodic table of elements have an atomic number, okay? And how you identify the different elements is determined by the number. Um, the golden ratio. Right? Golden ratio is fascinating. The golden ratio keeps popping up time and time again, especially in nature. Uh, it creates, uh, or your golden ratio can measure, is a measure of spirals. It tends to correspond with things that we consider beautiful, which is really kind of fascinating. And it, like I said, it pops up time and time again. The ratio is accurate for the spiral of a galaxy and the spiral of a snail shell. It's really quite fascinating. So, 
it looks like, you know, from Pythagoras' point of view, that number, number is everywhere. Okay? It's in everything. So Pythagoras concludes, uh, everything is number. Everything is number. Wow. I'm going to go walk down the path three for a little while. Well, I'm out here walking amongst the numbers. <laughs> I joke, I'm probably being too uh, uncharitable to Pythagoras, but this is basically what he's saying. But what are we supposed to make of this, right? So, you know, looking at the pebble again, I don't pick up the pebble and start plucking out the number fives. Well, no, that, that's not what's happening, right? Uh, Pythagoras isn't claiming that uh, numbers uh, fit together to make uh, pebbles or trees or me or anything like that. That's not what's going on. That's to confuse the difference. Uh, that's to confuse numbers for stuff. All right. Now everything, you know, all these things around us have stuff. Even Pythagoras is going to say that. Yeah, there's stuff there. All right. So the trees have uh, water, minerals, fibers. I have minerals, water some fibers. Um, I have, um, actually I'm not entirely sure what the chemical constitution of my body is, but there's uh, a lot going on there. Um, you know, the trees pretty much, uh, sorry, not the trees, but the pebbles, the rocks, pretty much just minerals, right? You know, that's stuff, sure. But that's not what Pythagoras is talking about, right? He's talking about the difference between form and matter. Matter is stuff, all right? Matter is, you know, the chemicals, the atoms, uh, Thales, water, well, that would be matter. Uh, even Anaximander's uh, uh, boundless, well, that's matter too, in a sense, right? It's still matter, still kind of stuff. Same thing with Anaximander's air, that's stuff. What Pythagoras is talking about is something different. It's not stuff, it's form. So imagine that you're at least a little bit curious as to what this form is supposed to be. One way to start thinking about form, or some words that we use when we start talking about form, is definition, limit, meaning, even essence is sometimes used uh, when we're talking about form. Form, like I said, form is in co contrast to stuff. In a way you can start thinking about, another way you can start thinking about, especially in, in the terms of the ancient Greeks, is to think about Anaximander's boundless, right? The boundless has no form, right? It has no limits. It has no definition, okay? It's stuff unlimited, stuff unformed. Uh, chaotic may not even necessarily be a good word because uh, that's, you know, still, we still kind of put some kind of uh, notion of uh, form or limit on chaos, namely that it's not ordered, right? Annex Commander's Boundless would, would and probably in some sense be both chaotic and ordered, if you can make any sense of that, which you probably can't. Uh, <laughs> um, but, you know, here, that's the idea. You know, the form is, you know, a really bad way to think about it is the mold uh, to which stuff goes into, and then it becomes the object. Now that's not the best analogy because form itself is not physical. Okay? It's not physical. It's immaterial. But things around us have form. They have definition. They have meaning. All right? You know, this is a tree. This is not a dog. This is not a human being. It's a tree. I'm a human being. I'm not a dog. I'm not a tree. I have a definition, I have a limit. There's something that makes me, me, and that, that. And for Pythagoras, uh, you know, the Pythag Pythagoras is the first one to introduce this idea. Yeah, there's something that makes me, me, and that, that. It's not the stuff. There's a lot of common stuff between us, but it's the form. It's how it's arranged. It's the order, the structure, the pattern. Right? Patterns are not physical. Patterns are immaterial. 
So this is Pythagoras' point. It's really a huge innovation. Pythagoras saw number everywhere, right? But number is not physical. He thought that all objects had form, and he further thought that all form was number. And the reason why is because he saw numbers everywhere. Now, before we move on, I really want to push on a point here regarding form. You know, like I said, form is not physical. It's not material. Uh, you have never seen the number one. You can't interact with it. You can't hear it. You don't see the number one. You've seen numerals. You've seen uh, representations and writing for the number one. But you haven't ever seen the number one. This is not the number one. This is a single thing. This is my finger. Right? That's a single thing. Now my, I've taken my finger down. That doesn't mean the number one ceased to exist. <laughs> uh, the form of one did not come into existence now and then go away. Right? That's not how form works. Uh, you haven't seen the number one. You've seen this numeral for one. But there's also this numeral for one as well as this numeral for one. And, like Pythagoras, we can even just represent it with a dot. Okay? So all of these represent the number one, but they're not the same thing. Therefore, any of those individual numerals, they're not one. One doesn't have a weight. One doesn't have a smell. One can't be thrown or created or destroyed. Right? One is immaterial. You've never seen the number one. You've comprehended it. And there's a big difference. Right? There's plenty of things that you see that you don't comprehend. <laughs> and there's plenty of things that you comprehend that you don't see. And the number one is only one of them. So when we say that, um, we have this, that, when we say that this is real distinction between form and matter, this is the big distinction. Matter is physical. It's stuff. Form is immaterial. It's not stuff. It's definition. It's abstract. Now this idea, this difference between form and matter, is huge in the history of Western philosophy. It influences pretty much everyone else. And the topic keeps coming up, especially whether there is a difference between form and matter. Right? How uh, later, philosophers, uh, later philosophers are distinguished by, try by trying to handle this distinction and how it's supposed to work. Okay. Um, that's a big topic of debate currently, whether there is such a thing as form, whether it even exists, whether it's just matter. Uh, Plato, um, Socrates, and Plato was most definitely influenced by this idea of form. He was very directly influenced by Pythagoras. Uh, Socrates probably was as well, and Aristotle carries on that tradition. And, you, you know, if Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle talk about it, there's a really good chance, like an almost certain chance that everybody else is going to, or you know, other people in the history of Western philosophy are also going to talk about that as well. This distinction is huge. I mean, it's a distinction between this pebble and the form of pebble. This pebble came into existence and it will cease to exist. The form probably, probably always exists. The tree, there's trees. It's a form for the tree. The form existed before the tree and will exist after the tree. The tree will come and go. The form stays for Pythagoras. Right? Um, it's the distinction between the concrete and the abstract. It's the distinction between the particular and the universal. It's the distinction between matter and form. So, so far, our philosophers have just been dealing um, pretty much with things as they are at a given moment, right? Athales, Anaximander, Anaximander, even Pythagoras, uh, they, you know, they have worried about the question of what constitutes a thing, okay? You know, um, you know, what makes that thing what it is. Thales, Anaximander, Anaximander, all pointed to some kind of stuff. Pythagoras points to uh, 
you know, stuff, matter, and form. Right? So there's not only the uh, what is constituted, but what it's made into. But they have really been dealing with uh, things as they change, and this is kind of this is a real issue. So uh, just just to think about it, consider Heraclitus's example. Heraclitus, uh, you know, is famous for this phrase, uh, uh, you know, you never step into the same river twice. Now, if anybody's been tubing on the Guadalupe and they've done it more than once, you might say, well, then where did I go? Because it sure seems like I was on the Guadalupe River, right? And, and yeah, that's kind of the issue here, right? Uh, in one way, yes, you never, you never step to the same river twice because it's always been different water. The water flows through the river. It doesn't ever back, well, sometimes rivers back up, but that's a whole other situation. You know, normally rivers don't back up. The water just keeps going from one, uh, from, uh, uh, from one end to the other, uh, onwards eventually towards the ocean. Uh, or at least lower, anyway. <laughs> um, so, that, so there's this idea that, you know, there's a sense in which you never step into the same river twice because it's a constant flow of water. It's never the same water that goes through the river, or you know, that, that you step into. It's always different water that you're stepping into. But at the same time, we want to say, yes, it is the same river. Right? I've been at that place more than once. I don't step into the Guadalupe and step into it again. I'm stepping into a totally different river. So this is the problem of change. Right? And you might think, well, that's just a problem with rivers. It doesn't really problem with everything else. No. Everything you've ever experienced, everything around you is going through change in the same way, in a similar way, that water is passing through a river. Just consider the sky. The sky uh, is a great variety of uh, chemical compounds in, in gaseous form. Right? We've got um, oxygen, at the very least, nitrogen, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide. That's just to name a few. I'm, I'm sure there's more up there, but I'm not a meteorologist. Um, not to mention the water vapor that's up there with the clouds. But you look into a different sky, not every day, <laughs> sometimes it's just a bright sunny day all the time, but you, you, uh, you certainly look into different skies in that sense uh, through the course of the year because the sky changes. Right? Um, these trees around me, you know, you might say these trees are pretty solid, pretty permanent, uh, but guess what? They're going through changes just like the sky. There is a flow of matter through these trees, at the very least water. There's other uh, uh, minerals and vitamins. These trees are living things. That means, amongst other things, that uh, they have a process by which they turn matter into energy. You do the same thing. This is the whole idea behind food and metabolism. You take in matter and you convert it to energy. Also, by the way, uh, you know, these trees have um, certain kind of uh, 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 certain kinds of matter in them, right? There's bark, there's water, there's minerals, there's sap. But it's not as if the matter that exists in this tree right now is the same matter that is, has existed in the tree since it started. No, right? The bark that's on the outside of this tree will be worn off and will be replaced by other bark. The needles that are on this tree, because these are cedar trees, these needles fall off and are replaced by other needles. So just like there's flow through the river, there's flow of matter through the tree. Same thing's true about you. There's the flow of matter through you uh, in terms of food, right? Well, there's a flow of matter in terms of your cells as well. Every organ, you are composed of organs. Every organ is made of cells. Every cell uh, is generated and after a period of time dies, all right? And new cells take its place. The process overall takes about three years for your skin. It's about seven years for your bones, seven to 10 years for your bones. I forget the ages of the other organs. I want to say livers are around three or four years old, but I, I could be wrong about that. Uh, even your brain, right? We've known for a long time that brain cells die. Some recent evidence suggests that they're also generated as well. So yes, there's a flow of matter through you, just like there's a flow of water through a river. So what uh, Heraclitus is getting at here, he's getting at this question of unity and diversity. Right? There's unity with the river in the sense that it's the same river, the water is flowing through it. Okay? There's unity in you, 
<laughs> in the sense that uh, there's matter flowing through you. But there's also diversity. The diversity is the matter that's going through. So the way to summarize this difference, this question of unity and diversity is, what is it that remains the same? That's unity. What is it that changes? That's diversity. What is it that remains the same? That's unity. What is it that changes? That's diversity. So, before we really get to Heraclitus' answer, why don't you ask yourself real quick, what is it that makes you, you? Because it's probably not your cells. Your cells come and go. Right? It's not the flow of matter. Right? It's what's holding, <laughs> however you want to think about it, that flow of matter. And the question there is, what is that? Heraclitus is dealing with this question of unity and diversity. Now his answer as to what the unity is, is fire. Okay. Now he's not doing the same thing as Thales, Anaximander, and Anaximandus. Right? What they were doing is trying to find the constituent material, what everything has in common. And yes, Heraclitus is going to say everything has fire in common, yeah. But he's not saying that fire is what constitutes everything. There's not little bits of fire that make everything. What Heraclitus is saying is fire is the thing that's changing. That's the unity. The diversity is, is something else. But fire is the thing that unifies it all. What ties it all together, what makes that thing that thing. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. So Heraclitus is pointing to fire, but he's noted something. He's noted that there, yeah, that there, that you know, fire does go through changes. I mean, fire is the unity and the diversity is, that is, goes, goes through changes. But the changes are really orderly, right? There's a pattern to the changes. Uh, you might even say a rhythm to the changes, if, if you like. And the rhythm basically is this, is that there's a downward movement from fire down. Right? Fire, he says, condenses into moisture. Moisture condenses into liquid. Liquid condenses into earth, and earth, in turn, eventually blows back up. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And it goes down to earth, and that's from that's the downward movement from fire on down to earth. There's also an upward movement, where earth uh, becomes less dense into liquid, right? Less li uh, liquid, less dense into moisture. Moisture less dense into uh, fire. Now. You might think this is a little silly. Have you ever seen a volcano? Cause that's kind of like what it that's kind of what it looks like. Volcano is Earth, and it's so hot <laughs> that Earth becomes liquid, and the really violent volcanoes spew up a lot of smoke and ash into the sky. Now, smoke and ash looks a lot like clouds, all right? And, uh, you know, if you've ever seen lava, that looks a lot like liquid. Actually, it is liquid, right? Technically speaking, it's liquid. It's not water, but it's liquid. Uh, and smoke and ash looks a lot like clouds, which looks a lot like moisture, right? And that goes right up into the sky. And if you want to know where the ultimate fire is, I don't think this is Heraclitus' answer, but if you want to know where this fire is, everything comes down, you might think it's the sun, right? That's an answer, right? The sun is really hot. So there's... So there's not, you know, Heraclitus isn't completely off his rocker when he's trying to talk about this upward movement and downward movement. Now, whether, whether you think this upward movement or this downward movement uh, involves fire, you can't deny Heraclitus' observation that there is a regular order to the universe. Everybody pretty much up to this point has noted that there's a regular order to the universe. Now, the question is, why? Why is there a regular order to the universe? So Heraclitus notes that um, there is an order, a pattern, with this matter. Oh, I'm sorry, with fire. Excuse me, not matter, with fire. Um, 
that there's this upper movement and this downward movement of fire. There's something else that he notes too. And uh, this, I'm going to suggest, should sound a little familiar. All right? So one of the things that he says is that fire, fire uh, changes, but fire's never lost. Even when fire goes from the downward movement down to earth, right, there's no fire lost. It's still fire there. Same thing as fire, uh, as earth moves up to fire. There's still fire there. There's nothing that is ever lost. It's just a change in its state. And fire is a thing that remains the same. Now, this should sound a little familiar, where there's changes in the state of it, but nothing is ever lost. We might even somewhat cheekily call this the law of the conservation of fire. So Heraclitus has given us this idea that fire is the thing that's changing. There's this upward movement and this downward movement. There's this order. There's this pattern. There is the uh, conservation of fire. Now, the question is, why is there this movement? Why isn't the fire just goes straight to earth and back up to fire, then hangs around liquid, then to earth and back up to fire? Why isn't it that it, it just changes all over the place? Why isn't it that it just stays fire or just stays earth? Uh, there is a pattern, there is an order. Now Pythagoras uh, calls this order reason or logos. Okay? Reason or logos. It is an order. Now fire doesn't have this order all on its own. Fire is given this order. Now if it's given this order, right, and it's reason, well then it's given by a mind. Now don't think I know the book identifies this, you know, Heraclitus thinks this is God. I don't think that's really a great translation here, or a great interpretation. Uh, I think what Heraclitus has in mind here is, because he certainly wasn't dealing with the Greek God, right? The Greek gods were nothing like this. Uh, he, he had no contact with the, uh, uh, with the Hebrews. So he wasn't exposed to any of the ideas about a God in that sense. Right? Actually, the closest that this notion of fire and reason and logos comes, the closest that it comes to it is something like Buddhism. And he didn't have any contact, or sorry, like, I'm sorry, Hinduism and Buddhism. He didn't have contact with any of uh, those cultures either. So he is talking about a mind, but it's not a personal mind. Or in other words, it's not a person. Right? It's, it is a mind in the sense that it deals with uh, reason. It deals with, you know, maybe something like ideas or definitions. It deals with patterns, but it's not necessarily what we would recognize as conscious. Not necessarily what we would recognize as alive. Maybe, you know, maybe it is, um, but we need not reach that judgment right away. Now here's where it gets interesting. Everything for Heraclitus is fire. Right? Now yes, this logos is given to fire and is given by mind, but it's not as if that mind is something other than fire, okay? No, it's fire too. In fact, everything is fire, right? Everything is fire. Everything, and remember what fire is. Fire is not merely the stuff, right? It's not the atoms, it's not merely the matter. It is the thing that remains the same. It's the thing that remains the same. All of this, <laughs> you and I, we're the changes. We're not the thing that remains the same. The, thing that, the, the unity is fire. All of this is the changes. That's the diversity. So since all of this is one in that sense, all of this is fire, and this universal mind, which gives logos, is also fire, the universal mind, this Logos, is everything. Right? This is what's called pantheism. It's the idea that everything is, 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 the, is the divine. Everything is the divine. Right? Which is why I say it's closer to Buddhism and, and Hinduism. It's not anything uh, like Judaism or, or Christianity or even the Greek gods. Right? This is uh, pantheism, the view that everything is God. Now, this, this is probably hard to accept, but, you know, consider 
what uh, Heraclitus has to say as far as his reasoning. And, you know, by the way, there are lots of people who will reason very convincingly for pantheism. So maybe Heraclitus just isn't as crazy as you think he is. <laughs>